Our special guest is former Secretary of the Air Force, Deborah Lee James, who is only the second woman to serve as Secretary of a military branch. She'll be with us for the entire podcast as we discuss personal empowerment, prevailing over adversity, and other wisdom in her book, Aim High, Chart Your Course, and Find Success. Secretary James, welcome to Next Steps Forward. Thank you so much, Chris. It's really a pleasure to be with you. From December 2013 through January 2017, Deborah served as the 23rd Secretary of the United States Air Force with responsibility for 666,000 military and civilian personnel in a budget of nearly $140 billion. She began her career in the Department of the Army and later worked on the House Armed Forces Committee staff. In addition to her years of public service, Secretary James has had a distinguished career in the private sector, including serving as president of Science Applications International Corporation's technical and engineering sector, a $2 billion, 8,700 person enterprise. Secretary James, you note that before these extraordinary successes, you had a different childhood dream for the direction your career would take, and you were heartstruck when things didn't turn out as you expected. Could you share with us what happened? Absolutely. And, and that's sort of the understatement of the day so far, Chris, because I was just shattered. Um, you know, a lot of young people uh, have really no idea, including when they get out of college, what they want to do. But I was different as a young person. Uh, I was very determined. I knew exactly what I wanted to do with my life from about the age of 14 forward. And that was I wanted to be a diplomat. So throughout all of high school, all of college and graduate school, because I did go straight through in my schooling, I pursued this singular dream um, to be a diplomat. I took foreign language. I had study abroad opportunities to be able to perfect the language. I, I do still speak fluent Spanish to this day. Um, I took politics. I took history. I took a focus on Latin America specifically. That was my passion. So I took all the right courses. I got good grades. I even secured a very difficult to obtain internship with the State Department when I was in graduate school. So consequently, when I moved uh, to Washington from New York, where I was attending school, out of uh, my graduate uh, degree work, I figured I had everything going for me that a 22 or 23 year old could possibly have. So I applied to the diplomatic corps. There's both a written and an oral um, exam that applicants take. And I kind of sat back with the greatest of confidence, waiting for that acceptance letter to roll in through the mail. Um, but like you said, I ended up being heart sick over the letter that I did receive because it was a rejection letter. And of course, you never know why. Um, you never know whether you failed the oral. I do know I passed the uh, written. Maybe there were just too many applicants that year. Who knows? But all I knew was that at the age of 23, my whole life was flashing in front of my face. I thought I was washed up and I literally went to bed and cried for a whole week until I could sort of pull myself back up and try to bounce back or as I prefer to say, bounce forward. So obviously it wasn't easy, but you picked yourself up and you landed a job at the Department of the Army. What were you doing at the start there and what path did your career take within the department? Well, first of all, you know, my whole career, as it turns out, has been focused on the military. So people may look at that and say, oh, this must have been an original passion or her singular original passion. Well, as you heard, it certainly was not my goal, nor was it even a passion, because in those days, I knew absolutely zero about the U.S. military or the, um, the Army. Moreover, it was the early 80s. We weren't that far beyond Vietnam, and the American public in general didn't feel the, the way that they feel today about our military. So I had no particular interest at that time. After the debacle with the State Department, though, I pulled myself out of bed. I started lying all over the federal government at different agencies because I really did want to work on policy matters in the government. But I got rejection after rejection after rejection. Finally, I got one and only one acceptance. And of all things, it was the Department of the Army which was not exactly my heart's desire. I was a GS9 program analyst. That's the way I started out. It wasn't my heart's desire, but it was my only opportunity and I did need to have a job. So I just decided I was going to take it. I was going to throw myself into it, do the best that I could do and see what happened next. So eventually you moved from the executive branch to the legislative branch when you became a staffer on the House Armed Services Committee. How did that transition come about and was it a difficult one to make? 
Well, first of all, back to the army for just a moment. Um, I threw myself into it, just decided I was going to do my best. And about three months into it, guess what? Remarkable things really started to happen for me. The first thing that happened for me was who knew, but military affairs and military as part of our national security was a really, really interesting set of problem sets, a very uh, interesting set of issues. And I really started to enjoy the work. Every day I would wake up, I would read the Washington Post and there'd be some headline that would be about the US military overseas. And I could translate just a little bit of my work into that major headline of the day. So I was feeling really purposeful in what I was doing. The second thing that happened was here, I got lucky. I fell in with a great group of people, almost all men, almost all uniformed. Of course, I was a civilian. Um, they knew tons more, as you can imagine, about the subject matter than, than I did. Uh, but they really sort of took me under their wing. So it was a great first team experience for me. And the third was I had a fantastic first boss who took a big interest in me. I look back on this boss. He was a two-star general, my first big mentor. And not only did he give me valuable feedback about my performance, you hope your boss will always do that, but he went the extra mile and he made, helped me make connections that I would have never been able to make for myself. One of those connections led me to my next job, which was with the House Armed Services Committee. And it actually was quite a smooth transition. So sometimes things happen for a reason, it sounds like. That's exactly right. One door closes, but 100% of the time, another door opens, but you have to be willing to take that risk and walk through that door. Yep, great advice. In 1993, President Bill Clinton appointed you to be, to be the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Reserve Affairs, which made you the Senior Advisor to the Secretary of Defense on matters concerning the country's 1.8 million National Guard and Reserve personnel. You oversaw a $10 billion budget and a staff of 100, and you're doing it all at just the age of 34 years old. What kept you from being overwhelmed in that role? Well, first of all, Chris, who says I, I wasn't overwhelmed? It was pretty overwhelming. I have to tell you, I had by now spent 10 years on the committee staff for the House Armed Services Committee. Of course, building my competence now, 10 years later, I knew quite a bit about the military budget, military personnel policy. That was my, my sweet spot. I actually knew quite a bit about the National Guard and Reserve because that was another one of my areas that I specialized in for the committee. Um, built my network, et cetera, et cetera. But then I got this opportunity. The first Secretary of Defense under President Clinton was, in fact, the chairman of the House Armed Services Committee, my boss, Les Aspen. And so it was through, again, that connection, but also having built the competence and having the trusted relationship that I got that opportunity to be an assistant secretary at a very young age. The trouble was I catapulted overnight from being an individual contributor, as most people are on Capitol Hill, to suddenly being the immediate boss of a staff of something like 180 people. And I had never led people before. So that was a huge learning experience. I made lots of mistakes until I started to really hit my stride. The other big learning experience during that job for me was being thrust into the world of public speaking. I had done little to none of that. In fact, I was terrified by public speaking during that job and for years after the fact. But like so many things in life, if you know your material, uh, if you practice, uh, you will be able to master it and you will gradually uh, feel that confidence that we're all looking for. Repetition, repetition makes things perfect. So that's, uh, that's perfect. So you made the move to the private sector after 17 years in government. What drove that decision for you? Well, I had been at this point five years as the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Reserve Affairs. Uh, a political appointment like that, of course, is not a forever job. So uh, there were several years left in the Clinton administration. I could have stayed on for several more years, but, but I made a strategic judgment that better to get out now when I'm not in competition with everybody else who's like me at the end of the administration. Furthermore, I had now been in the government for about 17 years. And I thought who in the world would ever give me a more expansive opportunity in government than the ones I've already had. So I thought I will set my targets on the private sector and I will go out there and hopefully take by storm the private sector and be a fantastic success just as I had uh, done in the government. It, it didn't exactly work out that way, but that was my plan A. So challenges between military and private sector. 
Military orders are given and orders are carried out. Was that a challenge for you when you went to the private sector where consensus could be more important than in the military or government where orders are issued and orders are followed? Well, there's no question the private sector is tends to be a much flatter organization. So uh, that's one one issue. You have to be able to um, you have to be able to lead not only because you have the command and control of whatever team you may have below you, but you also have to lead by by your ability to persuade, your ability to build relationships across the boards. So that was one era of transition. Um, I actually, to be perfectly honest, had a difficult transition into the private sector. Part of it was me, part of, part of it was this issue you just brought up, just learning. And let's face it, there are different, um, there are different ways that your, your success is measured in the private sector. So all of this was, was very new to me and transitions are always hard on human beings. So I think that was part of it. Part of it was me. The other part of it was um, I had up until this point really been blessed with having terrific bosses and being in these very supportive team environments. And so my first three years in the private sector, I didn't have either of those. I had, I'll say very difficult bosses, um, and team environments where I just wasn't hitting my stride and where I felt like I wasn't being accepted and wasn't able to fit in and find my, my niche. So it was kind of a down period for me. And I remember feeling that lack of confidence all over again that I felt right after the State Department uh, situation happened to me. Like maybe I really couldn't cut it after all in the private sector. So there's a lot of soul searching I was doing during that period. So that was a down period for you. Let's talk about the next up period. In 2013, President Obama asked you to lead the U.S. Air Force, a 660,000 person organization with a budget of $139 billion, which is larger than the gross domestic product of more than 120 entire countries. Being the Secretary of the Air Force is a very, very big deal. Yet when it was offered to you, you took some time to think about it. What factors did you consider as you weighed the risks and rewards? Yeah, well, first of all, after that bad three-year period, I finally did hit my stride in the private sector. Um, one of my fantastic first bosses, the boss on the House Armed Services Committee, introduced me to a company called SAIC, and I ended up accepting a job there. By the way, that shows the importance of mentorship and networks and keeping in touch with people over time. Um, I accepted the job with SAIC and spent uh, 12 years there, different jobs over the course of 12 years. But there's where I really feel like I reinvented myself to be a business person, even though I didn't have the traditional uh, business training, like I didn't have an MBA, for example. So here I am, 12 years later, I'm a successful, very senior executive at SAIC. We're going through a very exciting transition period in the company. Great things are happening for me personally and professionally. And boom, out of the blue, I get this call from White House personnel asking me if I would be interested in uh, basically interviewing for the job of Secretary of the Air Force. Well, I was so startled by the whole thing and also very flattered that I said I would love to do it. But truth be told, I didn't think it was going to go anywhere. I just thought they must have an idea of who they want. But of course, no president wants to be told, oh, this is the person they want a slate of candidates. So I played it out, played it out thinking, well, I'll meet some people. Uh, learn some new things, but again, not believing that it would ever be me. And when they ended up offering me the job, I was literally terror struck for a period of a couple of weeks because I didn't know what to do. And part of me was unsure about taking it. So what were the risks and what were the rewards? Well, as I saw it, you know, a key pro was to be able to make a big impact on a very large organization and put sort of my money where my mouth was. This would be the culmination literally of uh, 30 years of work uh, for me on military matters. And there were very, very serious issues facing um, the Air Force, many of which still exist today. Things like, you know, budgetary problems and which weapon systems and technologies to invest in. And what are we going to do about sexual assault and sexual harassment and so on. So there was an opportunity for a big impact. The negatives were it was a very divisive political environment. You know, political appointees can get hung out to dry at times. And I worried about, gosh, my reputation of the lifetime could go down in flames if I make a misstep. That was one thing. 
Another thing was I was quite highly compensated. And the difference between the private sector and taking a job like Secretary of the Air Force, it's quite a differential in money. And I was kind of worried about that. So there, it was not a slam dunk decision. But over time, it was actually my daughter when I revealed to her that I had been offered this position who expressed absolute shock that I didn't immediately say yes. Um, and she kind of like gave me that extra push, mostly because of the purpose, mostly because of being able to make a difference in a field that I had worked in for so long and that I was very passionate about, particularly the people. So I said yes, and now I look back on it and I considered myself to have been crazy that I ever questioned it because it was the experience of a lifetime. And I feel like, you know, solving problems is hard to do in a three-year period in a large organization, but I do feel good about having advanced the ball in positive ways, especially for the people of the Air Force. As you mentioned, the Air Force is a male-dominated organization. You were only the second woman to lead a U.S. military service. You know, what was that reaction? Was there sexism that you had to deal with? Can you share some of that with us? You know, I don't really feel like I ever suffered overt sexism. I certainly don't feel that discrimination ever held me back in my life from advancing. Obviously, I've had, you know, excellent, uh, wonderful uh, career, but certainly I have, you know, been in environments where I felt uncomfortable, where what we nowadays call microaggressions, comments would be made about women, things of this nature. I certainly have had my fair share of those stories. People who, I remember when I was an assistant secretary of defense going into a large area uh, to take my seat. And you know, it said the assistant secretary of defense reserve affairs on the seat. And I said, excuse me, excuse me, as I'm, as I'm climbing over people and I begin to sit down and I feel this tap on my shoulder from an older gentleman who said, excuse me, ma'am, that seat is reserved for the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Reserve Affairs. And I said, well, thank you so much because I am the Assistant Secretary of Defense Reserve Affairs. Things like that, where they were expecting um, a man to be in the role. What I've always felt is that every individual, a man or a woman needs to play to her strengths or his strengths, but understand that you're not strong in everything and you don't know it all. It's up to each of us to learn it all. And that requires us to have a good team and to have a vision, you know, speak up with the vision, but also to listen deeply. Uh, so play to your strengths, but always recognize you need the team to buck you up in ways where you are less strong. You had to make some pretty tough decisions very early on and through your tenure. The fight against the Islamic State, tight budgets, as you mentioned earlier, personnel cuts, and combating sexual assault and harassment within the Air Force. And you had to do it in the midst of an environment of political dysfunction, much worse than the days when JFK described Washington, D.C. as a city of northern charm and southern efficiency. Walk us through some of those challenges and how you resolve them. Yeah, well, there wasn't a whole lot of charm, and there certainly wasn't a whole lot of efficiency during those three years. And, and because, you, as you said, Chris, we have really, I'm sorry to say, gotten to the point where we are, we're dysfunctional in government. So when it came to um, decisions regarding the Islamic State, you know, my job as Secretary of the Air Force was train and equip and organize the force. So essentially that comes down to making sure that we have people who are ready to do their jobs, that's the training part, and that we have the equipment to match them up with so that they can execute. And then we send them forward according to the commanders who are in the field. So that, believe it or not, was probably the most straightforward thing because we had to do what we had to do. And luckily, despite the fact that we had you know, very constrained budgets, we were able to send the people forward who were most qualified and most ready to go. Um, it was hard on families. It was certainly hard on the personnel and too many got sent repeatedly. But from my standpoint, it had to be done. And so we, we executed on that. Um, the bigger, I'll say the bigger problems that would consume my day, day in and day out had to do, as you point out, about the budget. And this was the day, this was back in the days when we were living under sequestration, or even when we came out of sequestration, we were still in heavily uh, constrained budget. So there was never enough money to be able to do anywhere near all of the things that the country expected of us, and certainly not to have the people trained up and as ready to do as many things as we desired. And obviously the more training, the more safe 
people become, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So the training part was, was very, very um, important. To make matters worse on the budget, we were living under, and we still are, a period of it's just becoming standard to have a continuing resolutions. So if you can stand back and picture this for a minute, you don't know how much money you're going to have. You don't know how much. You don't know when you're going to know what you're going to have. You're building the the next year. Every year you're building a five year plan, looking out, and all of these budget years are jammed up. So it is no way to run the proverbial railroad, and it's no way to run an agency of government. And yet that was that was largely what we were trying to deal with. When you don't have enough money, you then have to start making decisions and tough trade offs. By the way, any tough trade-off you make, whether it's in training of people, whether it's in number of people, whether it's in uh, a beloved legacy weapon system, there is 100% of the time a political reaction to that. And again, we're living in kind of a, a difficult environment in Washington. That reaction can be very, very vicious. So, you know, the way you do it is you basically have to stick to your basic, you know, your basic high north. And you have to try to problem solve as best as you can. And, you know, uh, I'm a believer in order to get things done, there's a five-step process. You have to know the facts, investigate, understand the problem set. Number one, investigate. Number two, communicate. Now that you understand the problem, you got to try to build the case for action and explain it to other key stakeholders. Number three is activate. Okay, we understand the problem. We've explained it and got buy-in for for change, but now exactly what are we going to do? What's the proposal? What's the new agenda? When you have your new agenda, the next one is iterate because whatever you come up with as your first plan uh, probably is not going to be perfect. And certainly when you're dealing with the Congress, you have to be willing to uh, iterate and negotiate. So there was plenty of that that, that went on. And lastly uh, is to follow up because giving an order once or making a change and issuing a memo once and done never does it. You have to continue the follow-up to make sure that change becomes lasting and permanent. So all along the way, from your disappointment at not being accepted in the diplomat corps to becoming secretary of the Air Force to today, you've developed and refined a three-part strategy that you credit for helping you thrive as a leader in government and in business and as a mother and wife. It's also the basis of your book, aim high, chart your course, and find success. You call the guide to leadership and mentorship and write about the importance of doubling down on people. Let's start there. What do you mean by doubling down on people? Well, so often we equate, and when I say we, it could be the private sector, it could be government, it could be really any organization. We equate people issues with pay and benefits. And certainly, Fair compensation, I would say, is table stakes for any organization that's looking to attract and retain high, top-notch people. So there's no question about it. But I think that people issues go way, way, way beyond um, just pay and compensation. As I said, it's table stakes. And this is especially true nowadays, much truer than, say, when I was starting out 30-some years ago. People nowadays uh, have lots of choices, and they expect more from their leaders and they expect different types of behaviors from their leaders. And perhaps I did when I was starting out, as I said, I'll personalize it to myself. So people nowadays don't wanna simply be told what to do. They want to understand the why. They want to understand the context. So this places a lot of a requirement on leaders to be really good communicators who are willing to keep at it and keep explaining the why and provide that inspiration. Uh, that people are looking for. Inspiration is part of uh, job satisfaction because everybody, after all, wants to feel like they're belonging to something that's uh, more important than themselves. Uh, the other thing I think is, uh, in addition to knowing the context, people expect professional development. They expect to understand how they can progress in their career and then to actually see that materialize after X number of years. They want more and more flexibility in the workplace. I think this is gonna be especially true when we come out of COVID because not everybody is gonna go back to work in an office uh, environment. So that ongoing flexibility is going to be very, very important. And then I think another thing people want is they want a decent working environment. So by that, I mean, they don't want to be dragged down by micromanagers. They don't, they want a good team effort. They don't want too much what they used to call in the Air Force, queep, 
you know, additional duties, additional training, uh, you know, this, that, and the other paperwork, what we used to call red tape. Um, that's a real, that's a real downer to people. So to minimize that sort of thing can also help improve the work environment. So all of these issues to me are part and parcel of doubling down on people. If you get the people part of your equation right, your strategy, your technology, all these other important factors are much more likely to fall into place. Before we get back to your book, one of your concerns is suicide and mental health issues in the military. You've been impressed with one particular branch and its approach. Which branch is it and what are they doing right? I have been impressed, Chris. And by the way, uh, collectively, we don't have this figured out yet because for all of the different efforts that um, the armed forces have put on this problem and through successive administrations, we still haven't, we haven't solved it and we haven't brought those numbers down. So it's a, it's a, a really a bad, bad problem and we just have to keep at it. What, from what I've seen and what I have been most impressed with is the special operations community. So SOCOM has impressed me the most. And indeed, they have some of the highest rates of uh, PTSD, things of that nature, uh, because of the very nature of they've been in constant combat for 20, more than 20 years. So they have probably suffered greater burdens than other parts of the force. Here's the approach that, that they've taken, because one of the key problems um, when it comes to suicide prevention is people who are suffering, people who are having bad dreams, who are having different effects of PTS. There's still a stigma. They don't want to come forward. They don't want to admit it. They fear that they might lose the ability to continue to serve. They fear that it might be a, you know, an attack on their masculinity, things of this nature. And no matter how many times we've said, we want you to come forward, we want you to get help, there still is a stigma. So here's what the special operators have, have done. They have hired and embedded within the units uh, more mental health professionals. Sometimes it's a direct hire situation and sometimes it's just more mental health providers who are coming in through the army or the air force, et cetera, and they go into the special operations units. So now they're not going to a doctor exactly. It doesn't feel that way to members who need that sort of counseling or need that kind of discussion. It feels like you're going to a teammate. It feels like you're going to a buddy, a comrade in arms. And, and this I think is exactly the type of way that we need to do more of to try to destigmatize because people are more willing to go to a pal than they are to a doctor. And there's a greater sense of this, this person understands what I'm going through because this person is part of my very own team. So I've been very impressed uh, with what they've done and I hope that that can continue to expand in more parts of the military. Now you mentioned the word stigma and we've talked on previous shows you know, I think when we come out the other side of COVID-19, this is just general, not just military, you know, we're seeing mental health effects, you know, people being infected now. And then we come out the other side of the tsunami. I don't know what that's going to look like. You know, people are really afraid of that. But I think the one positive thing of this is that people are opening up more about mental health issues, about their concerns. Um, the owner of the Indianapolis Colts has a campaign called Kicking the Stigma. So hopefully to your point, you know, we can chip away at that word more and more um, so that GI Joe and GI Jane are more comfortable in terms of stepping forward and saying, Hey, I'd like to talk to somebody about something. hundred percent agree. So you said it's not just patriotism to hire veterans. It's smart business. Would you elaborate on that, please? It's absolutely smart business. Uh, all the companies that I'm involved with have programs where they are specifically targeting veterans for employment. And it's not just out of the goodness of their heart. Um, and the reason why it's smart business is because veterans bring key attributes and key skills to the table. And let's face it, you know, every company is in a war for talent. Everybody is looking to bring on the best and the brightest. So what are these key attributes that veterans bring? They bring a sense of discipline because that's exactly what they have learned throughout their time in military service. They bring a can-do attitude. You, you want to talk about get it done? Well, Military people know how to get it done. They bring leadership skills. Military members are exposed even at a very young age and acquire leadership skills that it takes maybe a decade or more to acquire in the private sector simply because of what they're thrust into and expected to do. Um, a lot of people come out with high tech skills, which are very, very valuable. 
in the private sector. And then the last thing I would throw out there is um, military members are drug free. You know, they're not allowed to do it and they're tested periodically. And so you can not 100 percent guarantee, but you can expect that this is going to be a well-disciplined, can-do employee who is going to get it done and who will have the types of leadership and technical skills uh, that you're looking for. Now let's get back to your book. Aim High has been described as part leadership book and part memoir. You found a formula that has worked for you as you've entered various challenging circumstances. Early on as a young person in an older person's realm, a liberal arts major in a tech-driven industry, a woman in a male-dominated arena, and a civilian in a sea of uniforms. One thing that helps you not only survive, but thrive, is your affinity for making and following lists. Why is that so valuable? Well, lists, I think, um, are what we all utilize, most of us anyway, whether we just keep them in our heads or whether we write them down on some sort of a tablet or on paper. Life is very busy for just about everybody I know, and it has multi facets to it. We have our home life, we have our professional life, we're keeping track of our children, we're keeping track of uh, social calendars, et cetera, and there's some complex problems that each of us has on our plates. So lists are a way that help me to remain organized, they help me to prioritize, they help me to make sense out of what can be a multifaceted and complex series of problems and challenges. So I find that that lists are a great organizational tool and I use them all the time. By the way, I almost, I almost lost it when the top 10 Letterman list went off the air when Dave Letterman went off because I used to look forward <laughs> to that list so much, but I do lists for everything. Maybe you can step in this place now. Yeah, maybe. So your strategy has three parts, chart and navigate a course, lead and inspire a team, and getting things done. Start with chart and navigate a course. How do we do that the way it should be done? Well, first of all, what do I mean by chart and navigate? In this case, I mean, there are lots of uh, help that's out there nowadays, particularly for young people trying to figure out what they wanna do in life, trying to figure out career moves, but ultimately it is up to each of us as individuals to seize that moment and, and take charge of your own destiny, chart and navigate your own course. And if you're the leader, you're ultimately responsible for having the vision to chart and help the team and allow the team to help you navigate for your organization. So it works both for individual contributors as well as for uh, leaders in this case. Some of the strategies, because these are, of course, broad, what I call essential actions, but there are strategies under each. So the number one strategy for me, in my opinion, under chart and navigate is this idea of always, no matter where you are in life, you ought to have a plan A. You ought to have some idea of what you want to do personally or professionally over the next few years. It shouldn't be set in stone. And you don't have to make a great big written strategy out of it, but you ought to have some idea of where you're going, because if you don't, the likelihood of drifting is, is out there. So have a plan A and know more or less what you need to do in order to reach that goal of plan A. But at the same time, recognize, recognize that life could well intervene. And for any number of reasons, you've got to be agile enough and willing to pivot to what I call plan B, which could be anything. And again, there's multiple reasons why this may happen. Take my State Department story. I had a very structured plan A, but I didn't realize my goal. So um, I pivoted to what originally felt like maybe would be an inter intermediate job uh, or a, a job for a little while. Because remember, you can always go back to your original goal. I could have tried the State Department a year later, let's say. But you don't know what you don't know. And it turned out the military was exciting for me and it was purposeful and, and I really enjoyed it and I never looked back after uh, I got hooked with a new set of issues that I had really never been exposed to before. So sometimes you pivot out of necessity. Sometimes you pivot even when you are very comfortable, uh, but there's a new exciting opportunity and you have to weigh the pros and cons. This is my story of when I left SAIC and I wasn't sure about becoming secretary of the Air Force, but I took a risk, I took a chance, and it turned out to be the best thing that had happened to me uh, at that point in my life ever. So there's different reasons, but you have to be agile and you have to be willing um, to take that risk at times. And then the third reason that you might need to pivot is you may do all the right things and achieve your plan A. But guess what? When you get there, it's not 
what you thought it would be. It, it's not fulfilling. It's not giving you that sense of purpose. I have friends who throughout school wanted to be investment bankers, not to pick on one profession, but once they then get the big job at you know, Goldman Sachs or JP Morgan, and they work a hundred hours a week and uh, they don't feel fulfilled, that's another reason to pivot. You shouldn't stick with something for too long that's not bringing you that joy and fulfillment. So as a leader, you say we need to lead and inspire our team. How do we do that? And we're for a team member, not a team leader. What do we do then? Well, I think if you're a team member, um, there, there are other strategies, of course, and, and they, are, they encompass both leadership as well as being a team member. So for example, one of the key strategies under lead and inspire is what I call speak up and listen deeply. So this is the importance and the power of communications and being able to do so in a collaborative way. So teams have to be collaborative nowadays or they will absolutely fall apart. And the best teams of all are those that have diverse people and bring diverse backgrounds and talents to the table because there's all kinds of data and studies that demonstrate that when you have different types of disciplines that are represented, the problem solving and the innovation will be much more robust. So, but you've got to be able to communicate so that the written word is important, clear, concise writing, uh, being able to speak. Remember, I told you I was terrified for years. There's large scale public speaking, there's small group presentations, and then there's just one-on-one -on -one types of, of communications. But all those forms are important. And don't ever forget that at least 50% of effective communications is the deep listening. And so many of us think we do this well, but we really could afford to brush up on it. Uh, so ask yourself the next time that you're in a meeting, is your mind racing forward to try to figure out what you're going to say next? Or are you truly listening to the other person's point of view? And are you truly opening your mind to new possibilities that could be forthcoming from the ideas that you're hearing? So again, that listening deeply is, is very important for innovation. It's also important for your own um, EQ and your own ability to lead and inspire because people also want to believe and know that you care about them, that they're just not some um, wheel in a cog or a number on a you know 100,000 person company list. They're real people and they have concerns and that you're listening and, and caring about those concerns. And finally, getting things done. You have what you describe as a five-step process to advance the ball. What are those steps and how do they all fit together? Yeah, well, this is what I was mentioning earlier. The steps are um, investigate. So um, don't be so anxious to show action that you don't get your facts on the table. And, you know, we're all data-driven nowadays. Me too, by the way. So make sure that you review the data, but also don't forget that part of your investigation in any sort of a problem needs to be talking with and listening to the people who are impacted. So when I was Secretary of the Air Force, I made it a big point to not just listen to the general officers who would brief me on a daily basis, but as I traveled the Air Force, I also would listen to the airmen at various levels, including the most junior, and get their point of view. Some of the most difficult things I dealt with when, when it had to do with the culture of a particular organization, I would actually do focus groups and ask the leaders to leave so that the younger ones would have a little bit more confidence and hopefully be a little bit more candid with sharing with me what the environment was at a given base. So that's the investigate phase. It's crucial for understanding the problem. Also crucial in this phase is know the urgency with which you must act. You know, some problems you have to make as a judgment call and move on to the next step within 24 hours, in which case you have a very compressed investigation phase, but that's the nature of huge problems sometimes. Other times you might have a month or two. So know the urgency and be able to tailor your investigation accordingly. The second phase is the communicate. And I call it communicate as phase two, but really you've got to do it constantly. You, you, you can never stop communicating. And this is where essentially you need to build the case to do things differently, build the case for action. You think you understand the data and the point of view of the stakeholders, but you've got to now explain to everybody else why this great big organization needs to, needs to change, what's in it for them, so to speak. The third is activate. So this is where, okay, 
we want to change, but what exactly are we going to do differently? So this is where you come out with your agenda items, different programs, things that you're going to try to do differently. And by the way, the leader shouldn't be doing all of this herself or himself. This is where the team has to be building all of this and coming, coming forward with the ideas. Um, the next phase, the fourth phase is iterate. So this is where uh, no plan of attack survives first contact with the enemy. That's a, a, a certainly a, a well-known military uh, statement. And it's the same in really any organization. So you'll have the best and brightest ideas, but guess what? Some of them won't work out so well. So get rid of them. Don't keep on, don't have the pride of authorship. Get rid of the ideas that aren't producing results and be willing to take on new ideas as they come forward. And certainly you may have to negotiate depending on what the circumstances are. That's all part of iterate. And then the last one is follow up. And this is where I think many leaders and organizations fall down. The follow up is not sufficient. So if this is an important change, if this is high on your agenda for leadership, you've got to call the meetings regularly. You've got to measure the results. You've got to let everybody around you know that you are spending your personal time on this matter and that you expect them to do the same. When you do all of those things and when it becomes consistent, I think everyone around you sits up and takes notice of that. And you're much more likely, if you keep that follow-up going over the course of years, you're much more likely to produce that lasting change. You also have something you call your zigzag theory. What is it? How does it work for you? And how can it work for us? Well, this kind of comes back to the plan A and plan B. You may think you're going in this direction and suddenly you go in that direction. So it's, it's, a, it's a zigzag. And it's, I, it, I guess, even more broadly, I would say it is the knowledge. I mean, I absolutely know this for a fact that very few careers are really um, linear. They're more of a, of a zigzag. You go here, there's an opportunity over there. And most of us, don't plan these things out perfectly. Because again, even if you have that plan A, frequently you need to pivot or you want to pivot because of some new opportunity that presents. So I think the more that we can be open to those zigzags, I even advise, particularly in business, seek them out, seek rotational opportunities that will get you different exposures that'll get you in front of different people in a company that will uh, teach you new disciplines, Back to when I was with SAIC, I started out in business development. I eventually attained a general manager position over a $500 million P&L. Uh, then I zigzagged again and became the head of communications and government affairs. That was a corporate job. Um, and then I got another bigger P&L role. So again, you, it doesn't all have to be in a straight line. Be prepared to zigzag because the best careers can come from having that uh, broader uh, knowledge and approach. You didn't just apply your insights and problem-solving skills in the workplace. You carried them home with you and applied them there. Finding the right work personal life balance is very difficult, especially so for women because they more often take the lead in caring for children. What advice do you have for our audience to strike that balance so work doesn't take over our lives? This is an especially important and timely topic during this year of COVID. And I think Chris, as you said, it, it has impacted everyone, but it has especially impacted women because women still do assume, carry most of the child rearing, child schooling, child supervision, household work, that sort of thing. And the blend of uh, being at home and being on the job, well, we're at home all the time, right? So there is no dichotomy. To the extent we used to have dichotomies, those dichotomies have really blurred and it's impacted women heavily. So my advice on this, just as a general proposition, we're not gonna be in COVID forever after all. So as a general proposition, I say, just like when you're at the office, hopefully you have priorities, right? Not everything is as important as everything else. And we're trained to do that in business and in government. What are the priorities? And then try to put your calendar um, accordingly, make sure that you're spending enough time on those priorities. The same is true at home. Now, one thing that we women do not have going for us is we tend to try to be perfect at everything. We wanna be perfect cooks, we wanna be perfect mothers, we wanna be perfect spouses, we wanna have you know, a great social life, we wanna you know, have our, 
homes be, you know, looking perfect, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And to do less than that sometimes makes us feel like, you know, like we're inadequate in some way. Social media, by the way, makes this even worse because of course, none of us put, put up lousy looking pictures on social media. We're all looking our best. We're all, you know, on vacations or, or whatever. And that feeds it because then, you know, you start to think, well, wow, how come I don't have this kind of a life? So what I say is at home, just like, just like on the job, after you have set your priorities, and I think for most of us, the children are priorities, right? The housework, if you come right down to it, you know, come on, that's good enough is good enough. The same way, at least for me, not everybody would agree with this one, cooking. I never really spent a great deal of time uh, cooking, and that was always okay. There's lots of ways to put meals on the table and have them be nutritious that you don't have to be. Um, a gourmet cook. So set the priorities. Secondly, have your support system. So we talk about teams. You have to have a great team at the office. Guess what? You need a great team at home. And so that could be your spouse. And by the way, even if you have a wonderful spouse who's helping you at home with children, you're helping one another, you as a couple can be burned out. So if you can afford it, I'm all for, you know, adding to that, contract out some of this, like, you know, have a house cleaner come in once every two weeks. Again, not everybody can afford these things, but if you can, I say it's way better to spend money on that sort of thing than it is to get a nicer car or things of this nature. It's your time is precious. So the ways that you can free yourself up, I think that that's the most important way to put your money is freeing up your own time. And then the last thing I would say is perfection is a myth. It does not exist. And this business of work-life balance, there is no one size fits all. It's all according to your desires. But if you are trying to be perfect in every way, you are hurting yourself and nobody else is perfect either. So let go the myth of perfection. You just do the best you can and understand at times your home life, your personal life is going to require you to lean in. And then there's other times that your job is going to require you to lean in. So you have to have enough of a support system in both places so that there can be that flexibility. You live your career these days by what you call the portfolio approach. Would you just describe that for us, please? Yeah, the other, the other way to describe it is I'm a gig worker. Uh, so that is to say, I don't have a singular full-time job, but rather I have a portfolio of part-time jobs. I'm serving on some boards, both uh, for-profit and nonprofit boards. I do executive uh, mentorship for uh, C-suite level leaders. Um, of course, I do quite a bit of speaking on leadership associated with Aim High, Chart Your Course, and Find Success. So I have now a portfolio of uh, different involvements. We have just a few minutes left, Secretary. Where can people find your book and how can they reach you if you'd like to speak to their group? Well, the book is available on all of the major outlets. So Amazon, uh, Barnes and Noble, et cetera. You can also go to my website. You can um, get in contact with me there. And there's also a way to buy the book from the website. The website is www.debraleejames.com. Dot com. So you see, I can never, I can never ghost you, Chris, because I'm so <laughs> obvious um, what my, what my uh, website is. That's DebraLeeJames.com. We'll be sure to put that up on the show's site as well. So what's your parting advice for our audience about how they can feel more empowered, lead through adversity and achieve their goals? Um, I would say, First of all, let's talk about leading through adversity because we all experience it. If you ever find a leader who hasn't, then maybe that's a real young leader. They will eventually. And if anybody my age says that, no, nope, that's never happened to me. My life has just been uh, terrific through and through. Well, then they're lying to you because everybody has it. So the way that you get through adversity, the way you lead through it as well, I think boils down to to, again, several, several key points. You have to understand that um, setbacks are part of life. Life is in effect an ebb and flow and setbacks are part of it. So um, periods of transition, like I said, can frequently feel like setbacks to you. And this is true both personally and professionally. So when you're going through a down period, 
um, you have to sort of reach way down yourself and remind yourself that this feeling of, you know, setback, this down period, et cetera, it is never permanent unless you allow it to be. It is never permanent unless you allow it to be. So I'm a believer in, we all have to grieve. We all have to work our way through these problem sets, but try not to take too long. Try to bounce forward as quickly as possible. And the way I try to do this, and this is kind of the number two strategy, is when I get beyond the the initial like shock or grief or anger or whatever, and level off a bit, I start to, with intention, I start to look for something positive, a positive lesson learned. Um, oh, an, oh, a thank God it could have been worse story that will help me look at this setback in a slightly different way and to learn something positive, even out of a negative situation. You can't do that on day one, but by day 10, maybe you can do it. By one month in, maybe you can do it. And what I'm suggesting is, Start looking as soon as you can, and with intentionality, you can find it. And then um, as a leader, it's terribly important when everything is crashing all around you and when things are looking a little bit dark, don't allow yourself to go to that dark place. You need to be transparent with people. I'm not telling, suggesting you look at the world through rosy colored glasses, but you have to be able to see the opportunity that is out there. And you have to come at that from a positive perspective. Negativity is hugely contagious, and you don't want negativity to overtake your organization. You want to bring that positive leadership, your A game, every day. Secretary Deborah Lee James, thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you, Chris. And thank you to our audience for tuning in to Next Steps Forward. I'm Chris Meek. For more details about upcoming shows and guests, please follow me on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Chris Meek Public Figure. We'll see you back here next Tuesday, same time, same place. Until then, stay safe and keep taking your next steps forward. All right. All clear. Great show, guys. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Chris, we'll see you next week. Have a great week. Yeah. Thanks, Aaron. Take care, buddy. You too. Bye-bye. Secretary, thank you so much for your time. Truly, truly appreciate it. It was an honor. Thank you. Will you send me a link once it goes up and then I'll put it on my social media and so on as well. So it'll be next Tuesday, one o'clock Eastern, and I'll get you the link in advance. Okay. Great. Thanks so much. Take care. Enjoy Florida. Thank you so much. We'll see you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.